Thank you, Joe, very much for the very kind introduction. Actually, Joe being uh, um, the head of the department since I started applying for promotions. So you sat in every single interview I had, I believe. So thank you very much. So, and thank you for being here, actually, to share this uh, uh, um, uh, lecture with me. We title uh, Bright, Flexible, Stretchable Electronics uh, of the Future. So referring to plastic electronics. So what I would like to do actually first is to thank the people uh, for me uh, making it possible to actually be here and give this lecture. My uh, dad, my mom, my sister, and my partner Delphine will sit at the front row. And then I would like to thank my PhD advisor and my academic mentor, Donald. Uh, Torfe gave me an opportunity to become an academic, and uh, I'm here to give this talk. Donald is responsible for me being here because he threw out the idea, since he rejected me for a postdoc, <laughs> to actually maybe I should apply for an EPSERC advanced fellowship, which I got. And here I am eight years later, this week, actually, just realized on Monday when I was putting the presentation together, which I finished just a couple of hours before. <laughs> so, typical me. So, I can't thank enough for all the people, actually, that have done the work. Um, since I arrived at Imperial College. This, this has some recent photos from my group as it evolves through the years, but there are many more people actually couldn't find any photos, uh, previous uh, members of the group, which actually contributed establishing our group and doing some of the research we're actually doing today. So thank you very, very much. Um, then I would like to just show you a very brief outline of my talk. I'll talk, uh, give you a very brief historical overview of electronics, what exactly uh, we mean by uh, electronics, electronic materials with emphasis on semiconductors, uh, dielectrics and uh, metals, pretty much all solid state materials, and then some highlights of my research through the years. So I, I didn't want to go into the details too much on the science and technology. I talk about my PhD years, my postdoc years, and my years here at Imperial College, and then I only have a slide about the future of plastic electronics. I, hopefully, <laughs> you're gonna get the idea by then what this uh, area is all about. So this is a uh, timeline of the uh, history of your electronics. Everything pretty much started at the end of the 19th century with the invention of the cathode ray tube by Brown. Then we had the demonstration of the first uh, tube rectifier, effectively a device that allowed propagation of current in one direction. And then we had the vacuum triode, or audion, being used for uh, audio amplification, actually, electrical signals, which was effectively the first device electronic device was able to amplify electrical signals, very weak electrical signals. Then in 1925, it was uh, this person here, uh, Julius Lillenfeld, which actually filed a bunch of patents describing what we now know as a transistor. But actually, Lillenfeld never demonstrated the actual device. It took quite some years until 1947, when Bardeen, Shockley, and Bertain actually demonstrated the first uh, solid state transistor, uh, the so called uh, bipolar junction transistor, and kick started a field of solid state electronics. Then, of course, we've seen other uh, devices, like we've seen the semiconducting uh, um, light emitting diode, LED, uh, laser taking place, just a very brief snapshot. However, uh, this uh, demonstration here, the bipolar junction transistor, and effectively the demonstration of the integrated circuits is what seed the development for the microprocessor, the personal computer, and every single electronic gadget we actually uh, own. So that was very important. So, and this was effectively established as solid state electronics. I must emphasize here that these three guys, and specifically Shockley, probably single-handedly created Silicon Valley by creating Intel and uh, all the other companies that uh, came to be known as the Silicon Valley companies. However, things changed a little bit in 1977 with the demonstration of the first organic conductive polymer. Until then, organics, polymers, they were actually known to be insulating. Like, for example, these uh, plastic bottles we have around us, they are actually insulating. <coughs> However, uh, Higer, McDiarmid, and Shirokawa, which would share the, uh, the, uh, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2000, demonstrated there are certain type of polymers that if you manage to synthesize, you can actually dope them and achieve metallic conductivities. So that was a big step because people start thinking, could we actually do what we exactly we're doing with silicon? So for example, creating a material and then we can dope it, we can make it more conductive, we can make it actually more functional. Uh, this effectively uh, gave, uh, attract a lot of interest. We've seen the first organic transistor being demonstrated, the first organic light emitting diodes and the first uh, photovoltaics organic solar cells. And then uh, Donald together with uh, Jeremy Boros and Richard Friend in Cambridge demonstrated the first polymer LED. 
which was effectively demonstrated the potential of, of this technology. And then the rest is history. So in order to understand the difference between conventional or you know, traditional uh, semiconductors, inorganic semiconductors like silicon and organic semiconductors, we have to actually just cover at least the basics. Yeah? So I have prepared a few slides which I describe uh, the basics on the band theory of solids, actually how these uh, 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 atoms coming together and define a, ma a material to be a semiconductor, a dielectric, or a conductor. So what we can do the, the more, in the simplest case, we can actually consider a substance, uh, an atom, effectively, that involves only one type of uh, orbital. Yeah? So this is orbital, actually. It's characterized with uh, uh, energy. Now, if this atom is just suspended in vacuum, this uh, energy remains constant. However, if we start bringing together more and more atoms, then this orbital will start interacting. So, going from one uh, uh, isolated atom, which can be described as a specific orbital with an energy, describing effectively how the electron uh, revolves around the uh, nucleus, uh, to a situation where we have two atoms very close together, then the orbitals start interacting. Then we have a small split of the energy because not both uh, atoms can occupy the same energy, the same condition. So effectively, we end up with uh, two energy levels, three energy levels in the case of three atoms, uh, or to a very large energy level, depending on how many atoms we bring in together, like in the case of a semiconducting uh, crystal. So this formation of a, a band, where it's composed effectively for many discrete energy levels, uh, very closely spaced to each other, is very important. However, if we want to have a better picture of an actual material, then we have to consider an atom which actually involves two orbitals. Yeah? Let's uh, call it S and P. It's actually like a real uh, element. Then when the atom is actually isolated, then we have the specific S orbital being characterized by an energy, and the uh, P orbital is a bit higher energy. Then when we bring a lot of this um, um, atoms together, we have the formation of bands. Um, the the P-band or conduction band is typically uh, 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 fully depleted. There is no actually free uh, charge carriers like electrons, while the valence band is mostly occupied by electrons. So one can actually uh, uh, change the situation in a number of ways. It, didn't sound, it turns out to be actually this energy band diagram shown here uh, for each material is what defines electronic properties. So we can say that for the case of the insulating material like plastic, for example, uh, the, this energy band gap, the difference between the S band and the P band, or the difference uh, between conduction and the valence uh, bands, is very large, and typically over five electron volts. Yeah? In the case of semiconductor, this energy difference is much smaller, and typically less than three electron volts. However, there are situations where these bands are accessible, so one can actually e uh, uh, inject a charge carrier, like an electron, or a positive uh, charge carrier, like a hole. In the case of the metals, it's a little bit different. Here we have the two bands effectively overlapping. There are different ways of getting a metallic conductivity, but this is what we see in, for most uh, metals. Now, the way or the energy at which these bands overlap uh, define another very important characteristic, the so-called electrochemical potential of a metal. So in the case, for example, of gold, this electrochemical potential, or what this is called Fermi level, is located around five electron volts. So if we have a semiconductor, where we have actually, um, uh, sorry, uh, we have a, a semiconductor where the valence band maximum is a five electron volt, then we can use gold and actually place the gold over there and inject some holes directly into the valence band. And the same we can do for the conduction band. If we have a metal, like for example calcium, which has a, a low work function, uh, we can inject electrons. So we can actually design a device where we can actually inject electrons or holes, depending on what we want to to do. And I'll show you a few examples uh, of such devices. Um, this is some materials that fall under these uh, very broad categories of insulating, semiconducting, and metal. So a very good insulator is silicon dioxide. Uh, diamond is also an insulator, but also can transport quite with high uh, carry mobilities, and I will explain what that means in, in a minute, uh, uh, charges. However, in general, it's a very wide band gap material. Then we have gallium arsenide, germanium, silicon, just very uh, often used uh, semiconductors. And then metals, where the bands overlap. We also have graphene, where the two bands are actually coming in contact together, but they do not overlap. These are the so-called zero band gap uh, systems. Um, so effectively, silicon 
it's a wonder material because it's this single-handedly effectively has enabled the development of the microprocessor, uh, the personal computer, and all the gadgets, as I already mentioned. So it's very, very important. Effectively established solid-state electronics as the dominant technology as we speak. It's, it's very difficult to imagine of any other technology that had such a huge impact in our daily lives. So silicon, why it's so interesting? So one has to take a look at its uh, atomic structure. It's a, um, it has four valence electrons, effectively four electrons occupying this outer orbital. And these four electrons can interact with other silicon atoms to form single crystals uh, in a diamond cubic crystal structure shown here. Now, this is a two-dimensional representation of such a perfect uh, lattice. The beauty of this material is that we can actually grow big crystals. And if we actually uh, dope them with certain chemicals, I'll show you how we can do this, it can become a very good semiconductor with carrier mobilities of 1,000 centimeters squared per volt second. Actually, this mobility, the new there, is uh, directly um, 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 reflecting which, uh, with the, the speed at which the charges the electrons, or the absence of electrons, which are the holes, are propagating through the crystals. So the faster or the higher this mobility, the faster the, cast the carriers are actually propagating. What that means is actually we can make devices that can operate much faster. That's the basic principle. So it's like me running from this wall to the other wall, switching the light on and off. So effectively it's kind of transmitting uh, information. So the faster I can run, the more information I can pack within uh, uh, units of time. So this is uh, very important. However, in order to grow these beautiful crystals, we have to use very high temperatures. So we can melt silicon at 1400 degrees Celsius. Um, we can grow very large crystals, which we can then dice, very thin wafers, and then we can polish them down to atomic level and fabricate a lot of interesting electronic devices. Now, what else we can do with silicon, which is quite a, a, a big advantage, is that actually we can change its conductivity. The pure uh, silicon is actually has no free carriers, no free electrons or uh, holes to conduct electricity. But if we actually introduce, replace some of the silicon atoms with atoms that have more electrons, valence electron or less, then we can actually add an extra electron into lattice or uh, extract one. So effectively introducing an n-type, a negative charge electron, or removing an electron, which means leaving behind a hole, a positive charge. So actually we can dope the silicon so effectively all the way from a semiconducting or semi-insulating all the way to metallic conductivity. So quite a very interesting uh, material system. We can also break the silicon-silicon bonds and introduce oxygen. And then we create one of the best dielectric materials we have available. A silicon dioxide has an electron band gap, uh, as a, uh, sorry, an energy band gap, as already shown you, of nine electron volts. So one of the best dielectric systems. So the combination of very large crystals, some of the most perfect crystals humans ever grew uh, around the world, it's made out of silicon. We can actually tune its conductivity with great precision, and then it comes with a perfect dielectric. And this is very important for building microelectronics. Silicon, by no means, is the best semiconductor available uh, around. But it comes with this very unique characteristic that enables us to actually scale up and make uh, fantastic uh, electronic devices. So what the silicon industry has been doing, it has been effectively um, demonstrating electronics using uh, the, the most commonly uh, the most effective building block, the metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. It's so effectively, it takes the name, but the metal, the uh, oxide, which is a dielectric, silicon dioxide, and the semiconductor, which is a channel region. And all this device is built on a single piece of silicon that we can selectively dope to create one contact, the source, another one, the drain, and then the gate, which is separated by the silicon dioxide that can be grown by thermal oxidation of the silicon all in a monolithic way. Monolithic meaning on the same crystal, the same piece of silicon. And then this device can be completely isolated on the same wafer from another one adjacent to each other. So this is the techniques that have been developed back in the 60s and enable the integration of this device into very large scale uh, circuits. Now the basic idea here is actually this gate field controls the current that flows between the source and drain electrons. Yeah, so this is a transistor function. Effectively, this device is nothing more than an electronic switch. Allows the current to go through or doesn't. And, but all this is happening through electrostatic coupling of the gate 
electrode to the channel. Remember, this is a perfect insulator there, so there's no current flow from the gate to the channel. What that means is that we just apply a voltage, but we consume very little power to switch this very large current. What that means is that actually with a very uh, small consumption of power, we can control a very large signal. So we introduce not only uh, switching behavior, but also gain. We actually, we can amplify very small signals using this device. That's why the, the MOSFET um, device being at the forefront of uh, silicon uh, technology and enable all this downscaling. So what the uh, silicon industry did, actually stick with the same material, like silicon, and then focused on downscaling the dimensions of the device. So effectively minimizing this uh, distance. Going back to my analogy, me running from this wall to the other wall switching uh, the light switch is a similar, if, we, if I can go faster, it's great, but if I can make this distance shorter, then I can switch this uh, light switch is faster. So equivalent. So you have actually to gain much more by going down in terms of the device dimensions. So this is where we are now. This dimension is 50 nanometers, 15, uh, 50 billionth of a meter. And in 2020, uh, they, we're expecting to have microprocessors that are actually based on MOSFETs made out of 15 nanometers. This is actually 100, 115 atoms of silicon connecting the two electrodes. We're really talking about uh, nanotechnology in action. So every time you buy a laptop or a tablet, most likely you have nano devices already making up these microprocessors that are embedded in those devices. So this extreme downscaling has enabled actually the, this channel length to drop to levels down to 7.4 nanometers by 2030 or so, and we are roughly there. What that means, we are now compact nearly 3 billion transistors in a single silicon chip. This is uh, one inch by one inch size. So we're really talking about really half the population in terms of number of, of people on Earth uh, of transistor packed in a very small area and a single uh, crystal of silicon. So we don't think any other technology will be able to compete with silicon anytime soon. However, um, uh, we'll see that not necessarily the case. So this extreme downscaling dominated silicon electronics. We've seen all these fantastic marvels of technology uh, coming in place, and not only. We also seen uh, renewable energy sources like photovoltaics made out of silicon. So we have actually, probably if you go and buy a photovoltaic panel, it will be made out of silicon. There's good chances. It's a big uh, part of the market. However, there are certain limitations. It's a temperature, it's a, of processing, it's the mechanical properties, and it's not necessarily the best material for a lot of other applications. So there's a lot of apl other applications who would like to have materials that can deliver less in terms of performance, but actually have some added advantages. And this is where organic semiconductors come along. Uh, but organics are not the only one, so I show you a few examples of these systems. But everything was actually kick-started by uh, this invention of the uh, dopable polymers by uh, Higer, McDiarmid, and Shirakawa. And effectively, we had the emergence of this organic, now known as plastic electronic. It's very difficult to define what exactly plastic electronic means. Even silicon can go actually plastic and flexible. So, but it's not easy. Um, so, in order to, to, to compare the two, uh, the different technology, we have to, we know, had a picture of the silicon microelectronics, and let's now look at what effectively mean by uh, 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 by uh, organic semiconductors. What exactly are these materials made of? Effectively, compounds that contain carbon, hydrogen, and a number of other elements. And because these elements are associated with life, we call them organic. So the simplest organic uh, compound is the methane, a carbon and four hydrogen, effectively. So the atom of uh, carbon is very similar to silicon. It has four valence electrodes. If we force two of this carbon to actually react, they form ethylene. Ethylene is used, uh, probably uh, you took advantage of that by eating a banana or having, uh, wrapping it in the right color in the supermarket because it's by exposing fruits in ethylene actually you, uh, you uh, trigger ripening in a very controlled manner. So it's a, it's a very uh, interesting uh, uh, product. So the interest for us is on the electronic structure of this ethylene. As you can see, we have the two carbon atoms interacting in a very unique way. We have a sigma bond in the plane with other, the rest of the bonds, but then we have this formation of the pi bonds out of plane. Uh, what that means is that if we add more carbon atoms, we end up with more complex molecules like the benzene ring. This is a six carbon atoms. And the 
effectively the geometry of these pi electrons allow any electron that will be occupying this, uh, uh, these uh, orbitals actually being delocalized around the, this little molecule. Then with a bit of imagination, if we can squeeze a lot of these uh, rings, uh, we can form more complex organic molecules which can become semiconducting. And this is a very good example of pentacin, which is uh, one of the fruit flies of organic semiconducting materials out there. It's a five benzene ring um, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. It effectively has a band gap and can be used to manufacture electronic devices. But the properties are very different because here the electronic properties of the molecule define the electronic properties of the solid uh, material that we're going to be using to make the devices. No, it's not the atoms per se uh, interactions, but actually the molecular um, structure which define the, the overall um, uh, crystal uh, electronic structure. So, uh, organic semiconductors are not only pentacin, there are many different uh, types of organic semiconductors. There are two main families. One is the small molecules, which is well-defined molecular weight uh, uh, molecules, a small molecular weight typically. And then we have the polymers. So this is typical, a few of the molecules out there, but actually there are a thousand more if you wanna have a look. And then if we actually take some of these uh, conjugated units, we can link them together and create polymers, very long chains of repeated units. One very good example is the polyacetylene. This is actually what's been demonstrated by Higer, McDiarmid, and Shirakawa back in the 70s. And they have managed to actually dope it and create a very conductive polymer. But then we have, uh, for example, the PPV, polyphenylvanillin, which actually is used uh, the early days as the light emitting um, material. And the list goes on. Actually, the chemistry is very open. So the library of Matilas one could potentially synthesize using organic semiconductors is endless. Something that inorganic, traditional inorganic semiconductors cannot actually offer. So other um, interesting characteristics which rise from these unique differences between silicon and organic semiconductors are summarized here. So for example, in silicon, charge carrier transport, for example, a hole takes place within bands which are formed through very strong covalent bonds between silicon atoms. Yeah, so this is very well uh, delocalized energy bands as I've explained to you earlier. However, in the case of organics, uh, the situation is it's a little bit more complicated. We have effectively molecules where carriers can de be delocalized within the molecule, but at some point we'll have to hop to a neighboring molecule. And that hopping step process is actually limiting at which the mobility at which the carrier can propagate through the crystal. As a result, we have Carrier mobility in organics around one centimeter square per volt second, thousand times less than a crystalline silicon. So it's effectively like me running in a perfectly flat street. This is silicon. And then in the case of organics, there are hurdles. So I have to overcome these hurdles. What that means is that actually they will slow me down. This is exactly what happened with organics. However, despite that, there is a lot of interesting uh, characteristics. For example, we can synthesize molecules with specific energetics uh, for example, the LUMO here defines how the conduction band delocalize along the molecule and the HOMO levels or the highest occupied molecular orbitals, uh, how the holes will be delocalized across this uh, molecule. So we can design a molecule with specific characteristics and they try to make um, use of this uh, unique characteristic. So the difference also is that um, the, the LUMO, so now we don't have any more a conduction band, we have the equivalent, which is the LUMO level defined again by the molecular structure of the single uh, material and the HOMO level. So here, again, just to remind you, is where effectively positive charges, like the absence of electrons, are moved, the holes, and here where the electrons can be actually transported. Yeah? And the band gap will define effectively what kind of color the semiconductor will be emitting if, it's to be made, if, if we are to make <coughs> a device like a light emitting diode. So by changing the molecular structure, actually we can tune the energy band gap of this material in most cases. So what is the most important characteristic of these organic semiconductors is their physical properties. So they are effectively molecules which are held together uh, through uh, weak van der Waals forces. So it's very difficult to dissolve them in organic solvents. Uh, something you cannot do with silicon. 
uh, we also uh, can take this uh, uh, solutions, and this is a few examples that I have prepared for you. This is a polymeric semiconductor dissolved in an organic solvent. This is another small molecule, and this is a fullerene derivative, a C60 buckyball, which is often used to make uh, organic photovoltaic cells. So we can take these solutions and we can start crea creating devices or building devices using very unconventional fabrication methods like printing. Inject printing can be a number of different type of printings. We can even use it uh, by spraying. We can actually grow films at room temperature by spraying. So very unconventional type of uh, processing compared to uh, traditional uh, inorganic semiconductors like silicon. However, we do pay a penalty because the mobility we get and eventually the device performance we can ultimately get from, this device, uh, from these materials is quite limited, yeah? We have organic semiconductors with mobilities 10 to the minus five. This is nearly eight orders of magnitude, or in, in other cases, nearly a billion times less than the silicon. So this is not really good. But actually we can find application that even that low mobility material can add functionality into our device. So these unique characteristics, um, have uh, kickstarted a paradigm shift in electronic manufacturing. So we're going from traditional uh, uh, silicon-based technologies, which are mainly batch-to-batch -batch processes, to something which is very, very different, to additive continuous processes, or processing even in ambient conditions. So for example, here is a number of uh, uh, integrated circuits are printed on a plastic substrate, PET, the same material used to make the plastic bottles. We can also uh, do this, uh, actually we are allowed to do this because the whole process takes place at a low temperature, so we don't actually um, uh, de uh, destroy our substrate material. Something you cannot do with silicon, for example, because silicon has to be melted down at 1400 degrees Celsius. So the question then is uh, how the electronics of the future will look like based on these organic semiconductors per se. So I can tell you they can be very bright. So here I have an example of an organic LED. It's made a warm white color, so for uh, domestic lighting. They can be definitely uh, flexible. And uh, I have a few examples of flexible organic uh, devices. This is one of the uh, printed organic solar cells. It's actually a module. I have no idea what is the voltage output, but I guess probably it's something like 12 volts. And we're also going to uh, have flexible displays. This is actually an electrophoretic display. It's the same type of technology used in the Kindle, the e-readers you buy from uh, Amazon, but the backplane is actually is made uh, using organic transistors, which are printed. So effectively, I don't know if this specific one is printed or uh, deposed in a different uh, manner, but the whole process can actually be very low temperature and hence the device can be flexible because it can be built on plastic uh, substrates. Uh, and definitely some of these devices will be stretchable. And this is some very interesting uh, demonstration from University uh, uh, from University in Linz, where effectively we see a, a really a stretchable, very lightweight solar cell being uh, made onto a cling film-like substrate. And here, some sensing devices, uh, matrices which uh, detect a number of uh, signals from human body. So the question is not what organics or other kind of a solution processable material can do, but actually what applications we will come up with and uh, then utilize the full potential of the technology. This is the, the, the big question here. So, because I'm uh, running out of time, I would like to move to the fun part of the story. It's where I fit in all this. So, everything starts with uh, my years as a PhD student. After I got an offer from Torfe, then I started my PhD uh, research. I remember it was August 1998, it was my first week, and a friend of mine took a picture of me while I was, I don't know what I was doing there. And the weather was terrible. So I left Greece. I was probably the only student ever started 1st of August, his PhD. I don't know why, but this is what uh, Torfi <laughs> told me. So I did uh, follow his advice, and I regret it. I think it was the coldest August the last 20 years I looked at uh, statistics. But there was a breakthrough the week after. Uh, after following a meeting uh, with my supervisor, said it's very simple. We have some equipment, we take some materials, we'll actually make some devices, we measure some current through them, and then we publish the results. <laughs> it couldn't be more clear than that. I said, this is, I can do this. But then we had another meeting. I said, you know what, we're missing a piece of equipment, so we have to build something. Uh, so I spent four months in a workshop uh, making something out of stainless steel. 
And I'll tell you, if you ever use the lathe machine or milling machine, it's not easy. So I did spend uh, four uh, months, but I get to publish, I don't believe still we published this machine uh, paper. It was my first publication, I was ecstatic. But what that machine allowed me to do, it was actually to create a lot of devices with slightly different characteristics. This is what is called combinatorial fabrication, where you fabricate 10 devices with small differences in their components, which allow you to map the parameter space. So you know what is better and what is worse. So effectively that means, in other words, I was doing one experiment, I was getting the equivalent work for 10 experiments. So that was brilliant. And all this I could perform under inert atmosphere, effectively under high vacuum, without exposing the devices to air. I do remember, actually, uh, Torfi asking me during my PhD interview, what do you know about organic semiconductors? I had no idea. I didn't know anything about organic semiconductors, but I asked the other candidate, which was, I think, we were two candidates, do you know anything? And, he said, and she told me, they were very sensitive to gases. So I told him, they're very sensitive to gases. So she probably <laughs> thought I was a genius. Yeah, she knew everything about organic semiconductors. So, but I knew that it was sensitive to gases. So I tried to protect them from atmosphere, atmospheric oxidants, like oxygen, water, and ozone, whatever is out there. That was very interesting. I thought, so then I look around in the literature, and I found that actually nobody has studied this in great detail. So I went ahead. I chose a material, and that was the nickel thalocyanin. That was a suggestion from uh, Torfe, because it was the least investigated uh, thalocyanin derivative. Then I built another piece of equipment. I don't have a photo. It was a two-meter sublimation apparatus. So I had to grow crystals. And these are the crystals. Actually, I took a picture yesterday. I still have them from my uh, PhD time. I was very disappointed because it wasn't as big as the silicon crystal I've shown you earlier. But then I get to real, I mean, uh, learn that actually organics don't grow such perfect crystals. Then I use these devices, actually, and materials to fabricate some very basic two-terminal devices, sandwich-like devices, that contain one electrode, which was made gold, and then evaporated film of this thalocyanin under vacuum. I sublime it, effectively just heat it up. And then I complete the device structure with another gold electrode. And then by choosing the right metal for these two electrodes, gold, for example, with the right electrochemical potential, I could actually inject some electrons into the homo level of the thalocyanin. Then the idea was actually to see what happened to the conductivity of the device as I exposed it to air. So this is my first uh, data, I mean, some of the first data sets I actually published. What we actually see here is a device measure under vacuum. This is voltage, this is current. And the conductivity, when I expose it to air for three hours, increases by orders of magnitude. Closer examination of the data allows one to calculate, actually, the carry concentration or the positive charges, the holes, per uh, cubic meter. And this is, as you can see, exposure to of this device for five minutes in air is actually able to dope it very effectively by nearly five, four, five orders of magnitude. That was a, quite a, an important... Uh, um, finding for me. So I went ahead and I did exactly what Terfi said. I wrote a paper and we published it. So the, the, the formula worked. So then the question is what else we could do? So uh, the idea was thrown around, let's make some solar cells. That was 1999. I said, okay, uh, what do we need? I read a paper, there was a, a mention of a solar simulator. What is this? Somebody told me it's a big lump. Then I went down to BNQ and I bought two kilowatts spotlight. <laughs> Actually, I went first to the department and asked for the money, but they told me there is no money in your account. I spent all my thousand pounds. That was my budget for the three years. And then I spent my money. I put this uh, solar, I mean the lamp on the ceiling and I turned it on. So my lab was very small, but very bright. So one day, uh, Steve, the technician, ran in. He thought everything got fire. Yeah, it got on fire because it was uh, too bright. They realized only I was doing an experiment. So what I actually did there, it was I created a so-called Schottky type organic solar cell, where effectively it's not a very efficient device, but allow me to actually generate some current. So here it's a zero potential I apply across the device, and I see that a small current is generated. So the device works as a solar cell. And the most important thing is that when I expose the device for one month in air, the device keep working. So it was great, so doping, appear to actually uh, improve the overall device performance. And then we've done uh, some fancy calculations and we published at least a couple of papers, stuff, isn't it? So the formula keep working, it's brilliant. By the time, however, my <coughs> PhD uh, uh, had run out of time, so I had to actually find another job. And the only option, 
the only offer I got, actually, it was uh, for a postdoc position in St. Andrews. I remember when I was interviewed there, it was very um, uh, cloudy and very uh, foggy. I couldn't see anything. I couldn't, didn't see the sea. I didn't know where it was. And I promised myself I will never accept the offer. <laughs> but then I had an offer, and I had no other offer. So I went to St. Andrews. And I loved the place. I stayed there for two years. Actually, there I didn't deviate too much from my PhD work. But instead of actually creating just two-dimensional devices and measuring the current in a dark room, I can now actually make devices that emit light. This was a so-called light, organic light emitting diodes. Uh, this is a more realistic picture of the actually this two terminal device. Here, actually, I was using the, the main advantage of uh, the project was actually we were relying on materials which emit light. But unlike these conventional light emitting uh, materials, I was using the dendron, uh, dendromer type version. So effectively, we take this conjugated core, is an organometallic. For example, this is a green light emitting, and this is a red light emitting core. And the chemists were attaching some dendrons, so like a spacing groups. And at the end of each dendron, we had a surface group which added some solubility advantage. So effectively, the molecule from rock solid, insoluble to any solvents, was becoming, once you add all these dendrons and the surface groups, becoming very soluble. And we took these uh, materials, and of course, I created two-dimensional devices. And um, by choosing now the right anode and cathode, because unlike my PhD work, where I effectively was focusing on a single type of uh, electron material, here I had to create a device that can inject holes, it can inject electrons, and these two carriers, opposite, uh, opposite charged, will recombine, creating optical photons, or light. This is what happens, and this is some of the data actually got back then. What is important here is actually apply a voltage across the anode and the cathode electrodes, and I see light. Then I calculate parameters, which effectively tell us how efficient electrical current is converted to optical uh, photons, or photons we can see. Uh, this is an important value here, the lumens per watt, effectively how many uh, uh, photons we can detect are uh, uh, created per uh, unit uh, electrical power we can show. And in order to understand this uh, actually number, 40 lumens per watt, you have to compare against other solid state, uh, or not solid state, but actually lighting devices, or light emitting devices. So our incandescent bulb produces 4 to 20 lumens, depending on how much money you spend. Then we have the office lighting, the fluorescent lamps, like uh, these lamps in this room here, which are actually quite efficient, 80 lumens. And 100 to 200 lumens per watt, if we go to the high street and see these awful yellow lights, which is effectively uh, low pressure or high pressure sodium uh, technology. So my OLEDs were roughly there, not bad at all. Now, that was just the beginning, actually. If you go now and check what organic light emitting diodes can deliver, it's much better. We have now a demonstration over 150 lumens per watt and competing head to head with state of the art inorganic based light emitting diodes. And arguably, probably will be a technology of the future for the lighting application. So, uh, 10 years later, OLEDs have gone very flexible and color tunable because we can change the color by designing the right molecule. They have also gone stretchable. This is a stretchable light emitting device. Actually, uh, UCLA group has demonstrated. They have also gone very large area, and actually, this is one of the white uh, light emitting diodes uh, have, uh, have in operation there. And most amazing, enable novel functionalities. For example, when the OLED uh, is operated in this case, uh, it, it emits light, but when it's turned off, actually the whole device is semi-transparent. So, so you can start thinking about quite uh, unique applications like smart windows, where you can see through, but then you turn on uh, the switch and the whole window becomes um, a lighting device. There will be a lot of shadowing effects there, I guess, but uh, it's a nice uh, design feature if you can have it. Uh, but then the picture actually here contains the ceiling, which has fluorescent light. So the artist impression was not very accurate, uh, I must say there. <laughs> but this is what uh, organic uh, light emitting materials allowed one to do. And I don't want to extend it to other devices like solar cells, but this is all possibilities uh, within, um, in the future. By then, my time was up in San Andreas. Two years were gone, and again, I was about to uh, start applying for a job. I was very lucky to get an offer from uh, Philips Research Laboratories in Eindhoven. There, I completely forgot the two terminal devices, and I completely switched to something 
called organic field effect transistor. I had no idea what the transistors were actually, but now all my colleagues are, they think I'm an expert in doing that, so I, I don't argue with them. So the organic field effect transistor is effectively very similar in function to the MOSFET we actually already uh, briefly cover. However, it's a different structure. You don't create the device in a single piece of a silicon or a semiconductor, but it, instead you're using layer structure. You start with a conductive electrode, a gate, then you have an insulator which can be inject printed, then you can have a semiconductor which can also be inject printed or solution processed at different methods, then you have the source and drain electrode. And the whole point here is to actually try to control the source drain current through the electrost electrostatically through the gate field. Effectively, using very little power, we can control a very large current. So we create a very good switch and amplifier at the same time. And we can do that by applying two uh, power sources, one to the gate and one to the drain and the source. So this is exactly what I've done. So I searched the literature and I tried to find what was the interesting point. Well, I mean, why anybody will be interested in these devices? And I came to realize that actually there were a lot of materials that were transporting holes, but very few that could actually transport electrons. So, and what I mean by that? So let's say that I bias this gate electrode and I accumulate uh, with a negative potential. That means I accumulate 100 electrons there. Electrostatics will require 100 holes to be accumulated on the other side of the insulator. Yeah, this is the, uh, like in a case of a capacitor. However, this can only happen if the semiconductor can actually transport uh, holes. And that was already demonstrated. A lot of reports show that actually you can make so-called P-type or hole transporting transistor. There was no problem. But when people were looking for electrons, there were very few materials out there that could tick that box actually a handful of materials that showed appreciable electron transport. So I thought that was quite interesting. And coming from my experience uh, from my PhD, which I knew that oxygen, for example, is a very good P-doping for thalocyanin, I thought that actually oxygen might be a very good trap for electrons because a very good dopant may be uh, a, a trap site, actually a species that will uh, trap the opposite charge. So I thought, could I actually combine this uh, know-how and how to make different type of electron materials with the knowledge of doping and create uh, and look at the semiconductor and see whether that's the case so I can make N-type or perhaps even more elusive devices, like for example, this is the electron transporting characteristic of an N-type transistor, or even make devices so-called unbipolar or devices that depending how you bias it, you can see both electrons and then at negative gate biases, you can see holes. These two current components attributed to a different direction of uh, currents. And using these devices, you can even make light emitting transistors. So people were discussing all these possibilities. There were a few demonstrations out there, but uh, theorists were actually puzzled by the fact that we can't see uh, electrons in every single organic semiconductor. So I set up and I designed an experiment. I said, okay, if we have a semiconductor with these energetics, then I will use one electrode source or drain with a work function very close to the HOMO, so I can inject easily uh, holes, and another one uh, which is in good alignment with the LUMO, so I can inject electrons. That was a very simple idea, I must say. And guess what happened next? I did the device, and I went back to one of the fullerene materials. This is a fullerene derivative that people used for making solar cells. There was a new type of uh, solar cells uh, in the block called the uh, bulk heterojunction solar cell. And this was the N-type component people were using, but never been used as a transistor material. So I make the transistor and finally I measured that elusive hole transporting character in an N-type material. So effectively what that means, I could measure electron current in, in this side, then I see the characteristic V-shape and then hole transporting current. Now the potential has been actually mirrored, that's why it's in a different direction. So finally, I could see a bipolar transport happening in a single type of molecule. That kind of trivial now, but back then it was kind of big question marks. So, and I learned from my PhD, I quickly wrote a paper and I published it. Then I came here to give a talk in, uh, uh, in the uh, EXS group, and I realized that Donald Bradley and uh, Jenny Nelson were working on the same type of materials and actually observing the same thing using a different techniques. But I didn't wait, I published before them. So they were very disappointed. <laughs> and actually I was very happy because I had no clue how important it was. So um, then the unexpected happened. Nobody uh, was expecting something like that. Greece won the Euro 2004. <laughs> so here I am in Netherlands, one week wasted of my time. Some of my friends are here, Agilas for example, 
and uh, we're all ecstatic. I can spend the rest of my time actually discussing this, but that's, <laughs> it's all history, yeah? Probably never gonna happen again. So, uh, uh, joking aside, actually, then I went ahead and demonstrated this bipolar character of organic semiconductors. It's actually a generic characteristic. So we tried a lot of semiconductors. As long as you get your device architecture and the interface chemistry right, you should be able to measure both um, holes as well as electron currents. We developed some basic theories and effectively everything worked as we uh, expected. It was a great news. By the time I was doing all this, and demonstrating also this very nice unbipolar. So using this unbipolar transistor, we could make so-called complementary-like integrated circuits and show that it actually works very well. But my time was up with Philips. So uh, then I had contact already Donald. Donald said, you should maybe perhaps uh, apply for an advanced uh, fellowship uh, with, the, uh, with the EPSRC. Hopefully, I think he was very polite to me, so after rejecting, uh, rejecting me as a postdoc, and uh, I took uh, the chance, applied for it, and I got a, a fellowship. So in March 2006, I joined the department. It was a very exciting time for me, and my office is just in that corner there. So I had a very good view, so very, very happy. So there, uh, early part of my work actually was affected a lot by this publication of the Roadmap for Plastic Electronics by the Organic Electronics Association. Effectively, what this uh, document uh, described was actually we need very good uh, transistor technologies. And the better your transistor technology is, the more application you can actually cover. And uh, why is this? Because the higher, for example, charge carrier mobility, which is a characteristic of a semiconductor, the more application uh, space we one technology can cover. So if tomorrow we come up with a TFT technology which has amazing carrier mobilities, which is equivalent to the silicon, then actually we're talking about serious type of application. We can do pretty much everything in principle. But we are nowhere there. I mean, but now I can blame my students, yeah? I guess, <laughs> all sitting up there. So uh, this is exactly what we've done. We started working again back to the fullerenes. After all, this was a molecule that can become even superconducting under certain conditions. So we started evaporating, optimizing the processing, and understanding a little bit the chemistry and the physics of transport at that interface between the dielectric and the semiconductor. So we're soon enough able to demonstrate transistors with electron mobilities up to six centimeters square per volt second. That was 10 times better than amorphous silicon that is actually used to make the TFT backplane for this LCD display. So it was actually a big jump in performance and actually hold the record for quite a few years. Uh, nowadays, we can actually use other type of fullerenes, but instead of evaporation in, under high vacuum, we can actually solution process at room temperature. This is some of our recent results where mobility up to two, three, two and three centimeters square per volt second can be actually achieved. It's very, very good. However, making only N-type transistor is not enough. It's okay for displays, but if you want to create more complex integrated circuits, then you also need transistors that transport the positive charges, holes. And this is because we want to create something that silicon have been uh, using to, to, uh, to build their very complex integrated circuits, the so-called CMOS logic circuit, that requires both P and N type transistors to be combined. So we had a look around, we effectively look at polymers and small molecules. So, and there were ups and downs with this technology. So for example, polymers can be solution processed, but actually uh, the mobility is very low, while the small molecules can be, uh, can, are able to deliver very high mobilities, but solution processing is not very uh, easy. So effectively, pentacin has to be evaporated, otherwise it doesn't work. So we thought of actually a way of getting uh, the best of the two worlds. And how we did that, we took small molecules that are soluble, but when used on their own, cannot uh, deliver any decent uh, device, and blend them with materials such as polystyrene or semiconducting amorphous polymers. This polystyrene is the same type of material Alice serves the coffee in level eight. So you can do more than uh, just uh, serve the coffee, yeah? You can add it to an electronic device. So we used this uh, material and soon enough, we actually found that we can control in a way the crystallization, how the actual small molecules uh, coming together, phase separating from the polymer binder, the polystyrene or other conjugated polymers, and create these very large domains of crystals. Actually, these crystals are very similar to a polycrystalline silicon, if you see, which I have here in the microscope. 
So you can see perhaps the big crystals showing in this uh, inorganic solar cells. So we're very uh, um, ecstatic and we went ahead and effectively we made some transistors. And the transistor, fair enough, they were actually pretty good. So we had now whole mobilities which are pretty much the same as the N-type, our best N-type fullerene-based transistor mobilities. So we, we had a two technologies that can deliver whole transporting, uh, devices and electron transporting devices. By using all these uh, uh, circuit actually uh, materials, we could do a little bit more in terms of uh, the uh, integrated circuits. That was great. While all this development were happening, there was another kid on the block. It's another type of material or semiconducting materials that start attracting a lot of attention. This was actually the metal oxide semiconductors. Unlike silicon, where the atoms are held together with very strong covalent bonds, uh, zinc oxide is actually an ionic um, uh, solid, but there is a lot of other oxides. You can see here, depending on how complex the oxide is, uh, it can be th hundreds of thousands or even millions. And these are ionic, so effectively the, uh, the, the bonding strength is somewhere in between the weak van der Waals forces that held together the organic molecules and the very strong covalent forces that held together the silicon atoms. But the big advantage is that actually there are versions of these metal oxides can be solution processed. They can be doped and can make uh, insulating. So effectively, take all the boxes from, uh, in terms of electronic conductivity, all the way from the insulating state to the very highly conducting one. And if you think if this is new, it's not new. Metal oxide has been around since the beginning of time. And we do have, probably all of you have a piece of metal, indium tin oxide, for example, if you have uh, a, a smartphone. Uh, effectively, the, the screen is made out of uh, transparent electrodes. And what we have here, actually my... Uh, my group prepared this, is a PET, a plastic substrate, similar to the one I was holding in the, in the photo, but it has a coating of indium tin oxide. So effectively, it's very transparent. We have prepared even the crest of the Imperial College. And uh, the transparency actually can be demonstrated by just contacting this little uh, crocodile clip. So effectively, current can flow with very little loss through a very, very thin layer of indium tin oxide. Yeah, or so-called ITO. That's a pretty uh, amazing thing. And then you can actually remove these excess charges and make these metal oxides even semiconducting, or even some of the best dielectrics are made out of these metal oxides. So we thought this is great. And I remember when I was back at Philips, I had already come across these metal oxides. And I remember talking to one of the, uh, the managers uh, over a coffee, and I said, have you seen this science paper by Nomura on the uh, metal oxides? Then he assured me that the technology was going nowhere because there was a lot of problems with it. And guess what happened next? Ten years later, you can go down to Carris and Dixon's and buy a 55-inch OLED TV, which is curved, effectively is a bit flexible, where the entire backplane of transistor is based on metal oxide semiconductors. So it was not a good advice, and I didn't believe the, the person at the time, but I couldn't do anything. I was working on unbipolar organics. So here uh, we had a very good opportunity actually making something or contributing to this field. So I called the company and said, okay, I want to deposit metal oxides. What do I need? They said, you need a sputtering system. I said, okay, something like that. I said, how much it cost? They said 300,000 up to a million, depends what you want to do. Say, so I don't have this kind of money. <laughs> Say, so how much money you have? Say, so a maximum couple of thousand. Then we all laugh. <laughs> so, frankly, we couldn't have the money, and uh, I was lucky, actually, because uh, we couldn't buy this machine. So, what we came across, actually, by looking at what other colleagues were doing at Imperial College at the time, we came across a technique called spray paralysis. So, effectively, what you do there, using an airbrush, which is used for painting, uh, model airplanes and cars, if you're into this, and you can actually take some oxide material in the precursor form. That means an organometallic salt that you buy by the kilo, dissolve it in water. And the only thing you need to do is to spray it on a hot plate where you place your sample. When this little uh, aerosol of mixture of water and this precursor touches the hot surface, it decomposes and forms the zinc ion reacts with oxygen to form zinc oxide. Once zinc oxide has formed, then it takes 2,000 degrees Celsius to actually melt it. So it's a very thermally stable uh, byproduct. So, and luckily, it is semiconducting. So this is what we did. But we didn't have the money to buy the, the airbrush. It was kind of like 100 pounds, the expensive ones. So what we actually did, and we'll try now to demonstrate to make one transistors. That's the first experiment actually I'm doing with uh, soot. 
But, so what we have uh, done here, we have brought uh, the actual semiconductor analyzer. We have a substrate, which is a silicon-silicon dioxide, and we have deposited some metal electrodes for the source and drain. So the only thing you need to do is to actually place this little substrate on top of the hot plate. The hot plate is on. It's quite hot, actually. And then you can use, actually, a, a spray. So this is exactly what we use for our first experiment. So could it be that simple? Look at the, around the literature. I didn't see anybody, actually, <laughs> done anything like that in the case of organic transistor, for metal oxide transistors. I discussed it with Donald. I think we are onto something good. Either we're missing something very important, or nobody actually tried to make the, simple, the simplest experiment and create. That should do. Hopefully, <laughs> leave it there to Anil. So effectively, when the aerosol hit the substrate, actually, depending on the material and the molarity of the solution, you can actually control the thickness of the byproduct, which is a zinc oxide layer. So we actually can grow very thin films down to 10, 20 nanometers thick by this very simple technique. Of course, this is not how we do our experiments in the lab. We have a fully automated system that we spend 50,000 pounds. <laughs> but actually, this didn't help with our experiments. Actually, it took us a couple of years to catch up with what we're doing with the airbrush. Now, what we can do, we can place the device here. And then I can get contact. Ah. <laughs> this is terrible. Contact, uh, actually, I'm not too bad with this. With the gate and the source, I have in front of me, actually, the, the probes. It's a very small device. What you see, actually, is just the IV um, current voltage. Bear with me. Oh, this is terrible. I apologize, guys, for, uh, for, to my students for complaining not producing a lot of results. <laughs> it, it's not easy. So I bring down the, these micro manipulators. And trust me, it's not easy at all, especially with a tie. Nearly there. I think it's there. If it doesn't work, I don't expect too much, yeah, I guess. What are we actually trying to measure now is the current flowing between the source and drain electrode as a function of a gate field we apply there. So effectively, we're trying to see if it works. Yeah, we have a transistor. <laughs> Yeah, actually, this is better transistors than my students can prepare. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I haven't prepared it uh, in a perfect way. Yeah? Of course, it takes time to actually evaporate everything. So what we actually see here is a logarithmic scale of the current. So it goes from 10 to the power of uh, minus 11 amps, so we have pico amps, all the way to uh, approximately 10 microamps. So it's a very small still current, but this tells you how well you can switch a very large uh, uh, off current to a, quite a very large one by nearly a million times, simply effectively demonstrating the transistor principle. So this is how simple it was. A search against the literature, nobody actually reported this. So we filed a bunch of uh, patents, and we published a lot. So, and the papers are actually quite cited. Very, very simple. But what this simple approach enabled us to do, actually use this precursor materials, like the zinc acid they have shown you, and start introducing also chemical dopants. So actually, we could uh, do uh, rapid prototyping of a bunch of materials without actually worrying too much about it. Of course, once it worked, then we had to work back why it worked. Yeah? That took us a big chunk of our, uh, of our uh, time. So this is now where we are. We can prepare this type of transistors at um, 200 degrees uh, 50 Celsius, the mobility of the electrons, 
Unfortunately, we can only get electron transporting transistor with metal oxide so far. It's around 20. So actually, this is not bad. It's roughly 40 times better than amorphous silicon is used to build this large area displays. So we're into something very good. And we're doing a lot of work to actually make this even better. The, our latest results tell us that actually this mobility can be increased quite dramatically by playing around with a more sophisticated channel architecture. But that's one side of the story. While we're doing all this work, uh, we also start looking at ways of improving the device performance, but not looking at new materials, but actually doing something silicon is doing, downscaling the dimensions of our devices. So the question is, could we actually create plastic nanoelectronics? I mean, certainly we could if we use uh, very sophisticated techniques for patterning the metals, like E-beam or very expensive equipment, but we know very well we don't have this kind of money. So what have we actually been doing the last few years? Developing new ways of patterning very small dimension devices and exploring this low dimensionality for enhancing the performance or even adding functionality. So the, this is the few last slides I have. Uh, the technique is very simple. We call it adhesion lithography or A-lith, thanks to Paul Stavrinou, my colleague, come up with a very good name. So what do we actually do? We take a, a substrate and we pattern some metal electrodes. Actually, I do have some metal electrodes here. You can see James prepared uh, just before. And uh, effectively, what do you see? This is the first metallization layer. It's again the crest of uh, Imperial College. So we see a glass substrate and then metal uh, layer. Then what we can do? We can effectively attach onto this first metal layer something we call self-assembling monolayer. This is small molecules which will attach at the specific uh, metal uh, surfaces. And these molecules can be tuned chemically to react with a lot of different metals. So, for example, we take this thiol, and if this metal is gold, and we dip this substrate in a solution of this small one or two nanometers long uh, self-assembling monolayer, the self-assembling monolayer will go and attach on the gold electrode and form a very dense uh, monolayer a uh, few nanometers thick. This is pretty, pretty good. Instead of going down, pot, uh, uh, top down in terms of technology, we're going actually using nature and go uh, bottom up. So what that means is actually we can make the surface of the metal, this metal one, either very sticky or very non-sticky. So effectively we make it uh, very hydrophilic or very hydrophobic. And then what one can do, can evaporate a second metal everywhere, like we have, for example, in this type of, uh, of device. So we went, from, we went from the single metal one, we apply the monolayer. You, actually, you can't see anything when you apply the monolayer because it's very, very thin. And then we evaporate a metal electrode everywhere. And then the only thing you need to do is to actually add sticky tape on top. Let's do it. James, now is the time. <laughs> So this is as simple as that. And surprisingly, actually, nobody tried, except the guys with the graphene in Manchester. It's like exfoliating the different layers. In, in our case, actually, what we tried to do is to remove the overlap of metal one and metal two because the metal two doesn't stick on top of the metal one because of the presence of this self-assembled monolayer, which makes it not sticky. So effectively, what we expect to see after peeling is to see metal one and metal two very close to each other. But we, what we were not expecting to see how close these metals were, actually. So, any of you has uh, on here, uh, on him, uh, electron microscope? No, <laughs> so it's safe experiment, actually. Nobody can tell what happened. <laughs> so, but what you expect to see is in the sticky tape side, should we see the negative image of the metal too? Not very successful. <laughs> but actually, you can see it here on the metal. So if I place it now there, perhaps we can see better with the camera. I can't even see myself, actually. Yeah. What do you actually see here? The shiny part of the structure is metal one. And the other part of the structure is actually metal two. And they are all separate. The two metals are separated by a very small distance. So the question was like, how small this distance is? So when we actually tried to measure with atomic force microscope, initially, 
we couldn't see any uh, we couldn't see any gap, but we knew there was no current flowing. So we sent the samples to Saudi Arabia at the University of King Abdullah um, Science and Technology, where they had a very expensive microscope, SEM, and we did see that the gaps were actually 10 to 15 nanometers apart. This is actually extreme downscale using this very simple technique. Unlike the spray paralysis, we haven't patented anything, but probably this is the most valuable thing we've ever done. But history is here to uh, will tell, yeah? So the question then is what do we do with this? We have metal one and metal two very close to each other. The question is can we create something, uh, the silicon nanoelectronics? Um, we're trying, but we haven't done it yet. But what one can do, can take this very uh, narrow nano junction, which are composing of a metal one and metal two, which are different. So therefore they can be made with different work functions and create uh, a device that the properties of the device will not necessarily be determined by the nature of the material, but actually by dimension, this narrow dimension. So for example, if by creating this type of photodiodes, these are the first photodiodes we made uh, quite successfully using titanium and uh, gold and aluminum and gold for the two electrodes. Then we place an organic semiconductor, which is photoactive and is often used as a blend of uh, a polymer and a small molecule. We can actually shine the light to the device, and then we see this little current generated at zero uh, voltage. So effectively, these planar uh, structures, devices, operate like a normal solar cells. They're not ideal. The current they generate is very little. But actually, what we are looking now to see uh, how fast these devices operate, because the, the extracting a carrier from this very narrow active channel should be quite a fast process, because the distance these carriers have to be uh, to uh, need to cross is very very tiny. So this is actually where we are. So if in the future, this is my last slide. In the future, if you ask how many uh, uh, what uh, electronics uh, will look like, definitely I can say that many will be plastic. We're going to have solar cells which are flexible and printed into large area. But the question will be, would be efficient enough and uh, costly efficient to produce so we can actually cover the entire room surface with the solar cells so we can harvest some of the light, uh, you know, we, this uh, 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 light does actually generate. So we actually, um, everything will come down to the economics. We're going to have uh, products like this one here, for example, is a solar bag. It has an organic solar cell, which is flexible, and can be plugged, apparently, and charge the laptop, although I'm not going to rely on this to charge my <laughs> laptop. But we may also have the flexible uh, displays. So the future, in my opinion, definitely will be bright. We're going to have lighting devices like this one uh, shown here. Going to be flexible, going to be bright. We're going to have these solar cells, which can be actually very uh, different to conventional silicon. We're going to have integrated circuit made out of organic or other type of solution processed, uh, low temperature semiconductors. And definitely we'll have some unconventional uh, electronics like these stretchable devices. But the challenge in, in my view is not actually what the technology uh, of plastic electronics will do, but actually what we want to do, what, what kind of applications we envision, and whether this application will be enabled by the technology that we try to develop. So I think the best is still to come, and that's why it's here, and we do what we do. And with this, I thank you, my, I thanks my students first of all, and then thank you for your attention. <laughs>